This was on an elk hunting trip. My friend and I was going to meet one of our party at a point on a road in the early evening. While walking along the logging road, we came up on these huge tracks in the road. They were on the road and off the road into the trees, then back onto the road like it was wandering. And also, there were more than one size tracks. Some were smaller than the others. The farther we walked, the more tracks we found. By the time we met our friend, we thought we wouldn't say anything and see what he would say about the tracks. He said, well, I didn't see any elk, but these tracks are all over the place. We headed back to camp and the next day we headed home. There is no doubt in my mind that these tracks were made by a mighty big creature. The tracks were about 18 inches long and 8 inches wide on the big ones and maybe 15 inches on the smaller ones. They had to be very heavy to crush the hard snow down to the roadbed like it did. I was walking down this old overgrown road just after sunset. I was hunting with my dad but he was like a couple hours up the trail besides me. Because the area we were hunting in is known for cougars, I was carrying a pistol along with my 300 caliber Savage hunting rifle. We were blacktail deer hunting. Anyways, along the way up I got this really spooky feeling. I picked up my pace and grabbed my flashlight out of my backpack. I kept on walking. Then after a good 20 minutes of walking, I unchamber my rifle and sling it so it's easier to carry because it's been 30 minutes past sunset. I'm still walking, I got like a mile left on the trail. That spooky feeling just keeps on getting more intense. I start picking up my pace. Eventually, I hear a loud stick break to my left behind me up on top of the hill. Turn around and shine my light and see it for a second and I swear it looked like a cougar, so I got out my pistol and loaded the chamber. I shouted loudly at it to try to scare it off, seemed like it worked. I put the safety back on and holstered the weapon. I start jogging only like one-fourth mile left. Then like 100 feet before I get to the end of a road, a jackrabbit hops out and starts flying my way. Me being spooked as shit, I pulled my pistol and shot at it twice. I hit it once and it went down. As it's clearly dead, I run the truck where my father is waiting, as he's scrambling to grab his rifle to see what the F happened. As I run up to him, he asks what the F was that, and I tell him. He then tells me to calm down and helps me take off my backpack. After 10 minutes or so, we go back to go collect the rabbit, but it's missing. I see the pool of blood where it died, right next to some cougar tracks. We don't hunt there anymore. I grew up in rural Oregon in the Coast Range. This is a mountainous area that is technically a northwest rainforest. Heavy undergrowth, untouched in most of the spots that we spent time in as kids. We weren't afraid of the forest. Our house backed right up against it. Atop that, we had a guard dog that would start barking like a maniac if anyone or thing wandered near the property. Well, my friends and I were playing that stupid game at twilight where you shoot an arrow in the air and then run around hoping it doesn't fall and pierce your brain. A novice archer, haha. We all were shot one arrow that went way off and landed out somewhere in the trees. My two friends and I wandered into the forest towards it but stopped looking almost immediately, seeing a strange green glow. The glow we found while trudging in deeper was due to worms on leaves. Glow worms are a thing, apparently, and a surprise because this was the first time we'd seen them. Well, we did what kids do, started collecting them. The next moment is frozen in my head because of its abruptness. Head down, pursing the leaves for worms, a loud crashing started up just up the mountain from us. This wasn't far away though, it was really close, meaning whatever it was had been there while we rifled through the plants. Two of us saw the cause, something very large and on two legs running down the hill at us. I would have thought human, except I could see the outline, and this thing had no head over its shoulders. So hulking headless thing running at us through the sword ferns and the fallen trees, 
We got the F out of there. Not to mention we weren't far from home. Maybe 5,000 feet. I don't remember hearing anything past the run which came out of someone's mouth. My parents didn't believe me. There really aren't any bears out in that area, just cougars and bobcats. I went back out the next day to verify that both the glowworms and the headless thing were real, but found evidence of neither. It was later on in my life that I saw the worms again, but never the headless. Whatever. Now keep in mind that I am very skeptical and don't even trust my own memory. If there was something like that in the woods, we'd have found some evidence. No one was camping in that area because, well, we'd have seen them at some other point. I grew up wandering the forest constantly, but the primal fear of being chased remains. Good day. Recently I went on a camping trip and ended up camping in the Black Hills National Forest in South Dakota. Nothing out of the ordinary besides a warning of bad weather and a general uneasy feeling going in. I assumed it was just anxiety from driving all day and the fact that I haven't tent camped without a group in years. I'm outdoorsy and trusted myself, I'm extremely respectful to land especially forest, and was picking up garbage and burying waste when I found it. Me and my girl arrived to the site rather late, it's last minute, and we decide to camp not too far off a dirt road in a designated camping spot with the tent and blankets in my truck. We set up the tent and watched the sun set before falling asleep in the tent. I have the feeling to leave my firearm locked up in my truck for some reason and decide to listen to my gut on this one. We crawl into bed and drift off to the sound of rain in the forest. I knew it was the anniversary of the Deadwood Flood, but I don't pay too much mind to it. I awake at an unknown time to the sound of the tent zipper being opened. I sit straight up and see a face of pure black staring at me in the darkness with a massive grin on its face. All I can make out is eyes and a smile. I'm frozen in terror and blink a couple times to find it gone and the tent untouched. My girl who was laying next to me asks me if I'm okay and I just say it was a nightmare, but I was okay and not to worry about me and to go back to bed. She falls asleep and I lay staring at the rain cover frozen in shock for a few hours. I've had night terrors or hallucinations, but nothing like this. It was too real, and it was too vivid to be a dream. This is her first time camping, so I decided not to tell her in fear of scaring her away from something we both discovered we enjoyed together. I taught her to leave everything better than how you found it, and how to be respectful and responsible and there was no bad intentions from either of us. I haven't paid much mind to it until tonight after talking about it with my roommate. I took it more as a warning than a threat. I've had spiritual encounters multiple times in my life, all of which being positive and giving me guidance, but this was different. Not a single word was spoken, and I was genuinely scared for the first time. We left in a hurry with the excuse of getting on the road. I'm still freaked out. I'm mostly seeking guidance on recourses and to get opinions on what this could be. Don't normally follow this kind of community, so excuse me if I missed anything. Feel free to ask questions. After a stressful day at work, I had gone over to my friend's apartment to shoot the breeze eat some food and play a few games on my friend's PS4. It was getting late and I had to be up fairly early the next day. My friend walked me out to the parking lot to my car. There was no one else in the parking lot, just us two. As I was unlocking my car, a dog walked out from the side of a nearby building about 25 feet away. It came fully into view and stopped to look at us. It was a little bigger than a standard Great Dane. It was all black with long hair that appeared to be falling out in clumps. It had long ears and a long, scraggly tail. I remember making eye contact with it. It had dark maroon-colored eyes, and in the moment we locked eyes, it smiled at us. But instead of a dog's lips going up and back, the lips went slightly sideways and I saw white human teeth. I recall suddenly getting a feeling of dread and fear. 
I felt like it was something disguised as a dog and pretending to be a dog. But it wasn't a dog. I'm certain of it. The energy coming off of this thing didn't feel dog-like. I don't know how else to describe it, but my hair went up on end. It turned around from us and began limping slowly back around the corner from where it had stepped out from. It seemed to have most of its weight on its front legs, walking with a hunched back. When it was limping away, I noticed its rear left foot was wrapped in blue gauze and the foot looked very odd. The heel was actually parallel to the ground. I am unsure if my friend saw exactly what I saw, but she suddenly said, it's leaving, let's follow it. And she ran after the damn thing right after it disappeared around the corner. I remember being scared for my friend, so I went sprinting after her. I rounded the corner to find my friend looking around confused. The dog thing was gone. At the rate that it was walking and limping, and given the close proximity to us, which again was no more than 25 feet, there was no way that it could have disappeared that quickly. The air was suddenly extremely cold, even for South Texas January. My teeth were chattering, and I told my friend to quickly go back to her apartment, lock the door, and stay inside. I warned her that that thing was not a dog, and told her I'd text her when I got home. Once safe at home, I texted my friend and thought that was going to be the end of it. But even as I settled into bed, my heart was racing. It didn't help that, around 12 a.m., there was low whistling right outside my window. My neighbor's house isn't too far from mine, but they're good people, and there is no logical reason for them to be that close to my window at night, whistling. I didn't make any indication that I was aware of the whistling. It wasn't even musical, just the sort of whistle someone is giving if they're trying to get attention. Eventually, the whistling stopped and I heard nothing else. I had trouble sleeping. I haven't seen anything or experienced anything like it since. I would like to state that although I do believe people experience alien abductions on a regular basis, I don't think I fall into that category. However, I do suffer from various sleep conditions, such as insomnia and night terrors, and I've had a few experiences that certainly fall into the attempted abduction category, even though I don't believe it's happening to me. But you're welcome to judge for yourself if you like. A few months into a new relationship, I woke up to find a huge seven-foot-tall, at least reptilian being with horns grabbing me by the wrist and trying to pull me out of bed. This is what I saw, as in I was asleep at the time, in the middle of sleep paralysis, very aware that this was happening, but not being able to do anything about it. So I struggled to fight off the thing and break out of the sleep paralysis episode. To my sleeping boyfriend, now husband, he thought I was stirring in my sleep. So he moved so I could get up and I punched him full in the face. Of course, once that happened, I snapped out of it and was hugely embarrassed by what had happened, but he was thankfully okay about it. On another occasion, I woke up in my room in the middle of an sleep paralysis episode, unable to move, very aware that there were two greys in my room, one next to my bed, one at the head of my bed. I mentally thought, OMG, there are greys in my room. They began to disappear through the wall and the floor and almost instantly the sleep paralysis lifted. Since that moment I have slept with the TV on or some sort of light source, I'm 36 years old if I happen to be on my own for whatever reason. It seems to stop the episodes, strangely enough. I've also experienced missing time. I used to work in a convenience store, and the route from my house to the store involved a short walk to the end of my road, crossing another road and circling a block of shops. In all around a 10-minute walk if I take it slow. So, one morning after a particularly nasty bout of insomnia, I left my house at a quarter to six in the morning for my 6 a.m. start. I walk down my road and begin crossing the other road when my manager calls me on my phone. Where are you? It's twenty past seven. I've had to open on my own. Somehow that little five-minute walk to the end of my road had taken me nearly an hour and a half, 
and I have no explanation as to why. There hadn't been a time change due here in England. We go forward back an hour twice a year, and even if there had, smartphones, etc. Change automatically. I don't recall anything about the morning walk, apart from feeling like I was waxing through treacle because I was so tired. I grew up on a street that opened up to a huge canyon or national park that had a train track running through the middle of it. My cousins and I would walk down it all the time when we were younger and explore. It had a very, very minor homeless problem in which men would live down there and walk up through the neighborhoods. Cops were called, and for the most part, it was pretty empty. When I was 13, I decided to walk my dog on my own down in the canyon. We had done it before, and I thought nothing of it. As we get down to the trail, we begin walking, and after five minutes, I get a weird feeling I shouldn't be there. I grab my dog's leash and decide to run up the side of the canyon which opened up into my neighbor's backyards. I am almost all the way up, sprinting through ice plants when I stop to take a breath and look down. I see two rough as shit looking homeless men walking on the trail I was just on. Now I don't want to assume anything here, but as a 13 year old girl still wearing her school uniform, I was flipping terrified. I don't know what told me to leave, but I'm glad I did. Definitely one of the creepiest things I've experienced. The following story may sound somewhat far-fetched given the accused shapeshifter's reputation, but I believe my friend 100%. Basically, a well-known Lakota chief was a shapeshifter and practitioner of black magic. My friend in Rosebud, South Dakota, told me that she has seen his legs begin to turn to dog legs during the ceremony where she was a food vendor. She would beat a hasty retreat when she would see this. She is from Oregon and is part of the Klamath tribe. Oddly, out in Oregon, she was adopted by Lakota people and then married a Lakota man. The following story is somewhat sordid and tragic. My friend reported to me that the Lakota chief was getting up in years and had a much younger wife. This wife was so shameless that she would yell out of her tent at powwows and other gatherings, asking who would come and service her because her old man cannot do so. I'm ready to barf just typing that, I'm sorry. Unfortunately and stupidly, my friend's son SB became involved with Lakota chief's wife. This got SB a mark on his head. As B was beaten and left for dead by the Lakota chief's henchmen. A good Samaritan stopped and got him help, and he was revived. Later, SB was called because he heard that a res girl was being attacked. That time, SB was killed by the Lakota chief's men who had set him up. They kept moving the body, so it took five years to find it. Nobody in the tribe would talk, and there has never been justice for SB. The Lakota chief and his family were a bunch of meth head, black magicians. The chief himself was a shapeshifter and murderer. If you compare the obituary in the Lakota times to that of the rest of the world, you will see exactly what the actual Lakota people thought of him vs. The glamorous image and legacy he left behind. This is a case of bad people sometimes doing the right thing. I thought that I would mention this to you, as it is an example of shapeshifting possibly skinwalker as far north as South Dakota. As to a bundle and pipe given to the Lakota, it was later sold it to two German women several years ago after the holder became drunk. The woman who bought it died soon after. As in the churches, there is a serious illness in the medicine lodge. My Hopi friend recently told me that they have a prophecy that states, our children will kill us. In the next breath, he said that everyone in his village is walking around like zombies with their cell phones. It would appear that the prophecy is being fulfilled right now. This was a heavy note to receive. I have kept this inside of me for over 55 years, and I think it's time that I disclose the event which took place in 1965. 
My brother, who I will refer to as Sam, and I witnessed aliens abducting two young girls who lived in the trailer next door. We never told a soul about this encounter, and now that he has passed, I am the only person left to recount the events of that fateful night, which changed our lives forever. We were living near Bossier City, Louisiana, as our father was deep underground in the Air Force missile silos, and he worked for days at a time in these bunkers. He had just come home on a three-day leave, and we were so happy to be able to spend time with him. Sam and I played rough with our dad all day, and we were bushed come bedtime. I slept in the upper bunk and my brother in the lower. Suddenly, around 3 or 4 a.m., we were both awakened by a low thundering sound and the most brilliantly colored light display just outside our window at the foot of our bunk bed. I moved to the window and looked down to see Sam looking out as well. We both watched a flying saucer land in the field, close to our neighbor's trailer. Our family was very close to these neighbors, and the two young girls living there were friends to my brother and me. I can't recall their names, but they were approximately seven and ten years old. We debated about waking our parents, but we were so frightened and thought if we woke them, they start turning on outside lights or walk outside with weapons. There would be bloodshed and sheer panic in the trailer park. So we sat very quietly and simply observed. This flying saucer was about 50 feet in diameter and had multicolored lights around the perimeter. Everything beneath the craft was distorted and wavy as it was gently settling down in the dirt field. There were four metal legs that slid down from the craft with round pads on each. All of the lights on the craft went out within about 30 seconds after it landed but a light blue glow started to envelop the craft, and it made the area around it glow as well. Then, a ramp slid down from the craft, and a door opened up, and we could partially see inside the ship. There were dull red and orange lights on the walls, and an electrical crackling sound emanating from the interior. Then the interior lights went out, and the weird sound stopped. Suddenly, a figure started to walk down the ramp, and was followed by another. Now, Sam and I were never allowed to watch any science fiction shows or movies with aliens or spaceships. I had never even seen a drawing or picture of a saucer before this. We were allowed to watch cartoons like Scooby-Doo and Bugs Bunny, along with shows like The Wonderful World of Disney and Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. So this was truly an adventurous night for us, and definitely something very new. The first two beings walking down the ramp made their way into the light of our neighbor's yard. There was a light on the back of their trailer and their porch. When they got closer to the brighter light on their porch, we could see they were dressed in the same color suits. But the weird thing was that their skin appeared to be the same color as well. They looked human in shape and size, but moved in a way that made them function more like robots. Every movement was very smooth and effortless, as though they were moving about in the water. They now remind me of the Blue Man Group from Vegas, because they were completely blue all over. Then another two beings exited the craft and they were green. Another two that were red, until there were six of them in all. They walked in line up to the door of the trailer. They all passed right through the door without opening it. That scared the heck out of us. More so than the landing of the craft. We were asking each other, Did you see that? What are they going to do with our friends? Minutes later, they passed through the door again, and they were leading the two girls all the way back to their ship. The girls appeared as though they were sleepwalking and even had their eyes closed. They walked just fine, without any help from these strange beings. Now, if you are wondering, yes, the girls passed right through the door, without it being opened too. About five minutes later, they exited the ship and lead the girls back into the trailer. But when the beings passed through the door for the last time as they were coming out, they all crouched down slightly, turned, and looked directly at our window. Each one did this in succession, and they smiled and waved at us. Now at this point, my brother and I were in complete shock. 
We were also completely mesmerized. I looked at Sam and he looked at me. But we were unable to say a word. They entered the ship, and as the last one went inside, the interior lights returned. The strange noise started up again, and the door closed. The ramp slid back up inside the craft, and as it slowly lifted off the ground, the four legs retracted up as well. The amazingly colorful lights came back on, around the perimeter of the ship, and it slowly lifted skyward, until it was about 25 feet in the air. Then it shot straight up and out of sight in less than a second. The last being standing at the door of the ship waved at Sam and me before it closed. I thought I should point that out as well, because that is the lasting image that burned into my memory ever since that strange night. My brother and I talked about that night, possibly thousands of times before he passed away in 2009, but we never discussed it with anyone else. Ever. We tried so hard to see if there was anything different about our neighbor's daughters after that night. But we didn't notice anything unusual. That event troubles me to this day. More so than any other event. I have often wondered if Sam and I were the actual abductees and the memory of the girl's abduction was planted. But in any case, two or possibly even four people were contacted abducted that night. Of that I am sure. I now need to find answers to this event somehow, even if it means going to a qualified hypnotist experienced in the abduction phenomena. I have to know exactly what happened in 1965. I wonder if those two young girls are now going through abduction therapy as adults. So many unanswered questions and I think about that night every single day of my life. I need to get this monkey off of my back somehow. And this helps to finally tell the world about that strange night. I was walking on the hill with my two Labradors when, out of nowhere, they went into a frenzy. They ran in circles, growling and snapping at the air, until they eventually collapsed to the ground, tails tucked beneath them. Bewildered, I scanned the surroundings and spotted a huge creature at a distance to the side. It appeared translucent, as I could see the grass of the hill through its body, but it was covered in long, charcoal-colored hair. Oddly, it left no trace on the grass. The creature had elongated, glowing red slits for eyes, nose-like holes, thick lips, and stood well over ten feet tall on two legs. Filled with terror, I began to pray and after a few moments, the creature slowly faded out of sight. I hastily left the hill, with my two dogs whimpering close behind me. I was asleep on the couch at my girlfriend's house, surrounded by pitch-black darkness. Suddenly, a dark figure materialized in the hallway. It had a human-like shape and appeared even darker than the surrounding darkness. The figure's head reached the ceiling, slightly bending forward as if constrained by the low height. I lay there, struggling to comprehend what my eyes were witnessing. Attempts to speak proved futile as no words emerged from my mouth. Even my attempts to yell resulted in nothing more than a whisper. The room grew colder as the figure glided forward with an eerie grace. I desperately tried to move, but my body refused to obey, except for an involuntary tremble. The silhouette entered the living room, navigating the walls while keeping its head turned towards me. I followed its movements, transfixed, as it passed behind the stove and through the stovepipe as if nothing obstructed its path. The dark figure drew nearer and nearer to the couch where I lay, now positioned right beside it. Staring at the figure, an overwhelming sense of pure evil engulfed me. My mind went numb, and tears welled up in my eyes. Gradually, laughter echoed in the distance, a malevolent, otherworldly laughter. It grew louder, resembling a gathering of people engaged in a chaotic party with multiple conversations overlapping. Amidst the laughter, I heard a high-pitched woman's voice say, We scared him to death. In that moment, my mind turned to prayer. Summoning all my strength, I cried out, God, help me! 
Miraculously, the dark apparition began to fade until it vanished completely from my sight. The chilling coldness in the room was replaced by the comforting warmth radiating from the stove. Thanks for listening yet another episode of Nightmare Hours. If you love our stories, do hit that subscribe button. Good night, folks, and see you tomorrow at the same time.